to church this morning. Amen. Amen. Y'all excited about revival in your heart? Praise God. Only the Lord can do that. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I found myself dead. I was born dead in Adam. I found myself dead as a teenager. Uh, my sister, thank God she got saved and she started to tell me the good news about Jesus. I can remember taking rides with her. I live with my mom in Lafayette. She'd come pick me up. She had this big old Buick and it would bounce, bounce up and down on the road as we went. And she would stick it in there and tape some preachers and had testimonies about miracles. And she, she reminded me about it the other day. She said, you remember how she said I used to get so excited when I'd come pick you up and I'd bring you to Morgan City. Because she said as soon as the first tape was done, you'd say stick another one in there. <laughs> stick another one in there. Amen. And so I'm just so grateful, you know. That, that God changed somebody's life that was close to me, and through that testimony, he introduced himself to me, amen? And I don't know what your story is, but I know that you had somebody that loved you and cared about you, that told you the good news of the gospel, or at least invited you to church where you heard the good news of the gospel. And, and you know, my message this morning, I've titled it Responsibility, but it's actually two words, not one. Response. Ability. In other words, you have an ability to make a response. Amen. And, uh, you know, my message this morning has a lot more to do, not so much with coming to Christ, but actually living for Christ. Amen. Because, you know, whenever we give our heart to the Lord, once we hear the good news of the gospel and, and we get saved, meaning we, we, we surrender to God and we ask the Lord to come into our heart and to forgive us of our sins. That's really just the beginning. I got to tell you, because what God wants from his people is that they would begin to, to live for him and to begin to live their life in such a way that it's a reflection of his life. That's that's what the, the Lord wants. And that's what the word of God teaches. You're just going to have to take my word for it this morning, that that's what God wants from us. But now I will tell you this. He doesn't want you to have to try to do that on your own. He doesn't expect you to do that in your own strength. You know, true Christianity, daily living in Christianity is not about willpower. Because your will, my will, is not strong enough to overcome the power of sin. Whatever the power of sin is that you deal with in your particular life. We all have different types of struggles. Some people have struggles <laughs> with drugs. Some people have struggles with alcohol. Some people, whatever it is, some people have struggles with a bad attitude. But what I want you to know is this, is that learning how to walk with God according to his word. Now listen, it's a lifelong process. It doesn't happen overnight. Amen. And, and it's a process to learn of God and to understand how to walk for him. But that's a big part of what. My message is really about this morning. Again, the title is Responsibility. Now, prior to the passage of Scripture that I'm going to read to you here in just a moment, there's several things that are taking place in this story. It's basically the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. Are y'all cold? No, y'all feel good? All right. First, I want you to know that if you'll remember the story, Jesus pleads for prayer. You remember that? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, you know... The, the word Gethsemane literally means olive press, in case you didn't know that. So the, the Garden of Gethsemane was on the Mount of Olives. So it's on a, And the Mount of Olives still exists uh, right now. People still pick olives off of there. They press olives. As a matter of fact, I bought some olive oil from a, Palest, from a Palestinian woman. She got it, her, her father picks olives, and, uh, and they make olive oil, and they import it to the United States of America. It's some good olive oil, I'm telling you. So, so, so it was on the Mount of Olives, and there's a garden on the Mount of Olives called, called the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane, again, means olive press. And so what's interesting to me is, is that Jesus was in the press. Amen? You know, the Word of God teaches us that many times in our life that there will be tribulation. That word tribulation means to be pressed. It means that certain things can happen in our lives. Events are orchestrated. They're, they're oftentimes planned by the devil in your life to bring destruction to you, to make you quit on God. But I got I to gotta remind you that nothing can happen in your life that God doesn't allow to happen. I believe that. And, and I get that based on the book of Job. Because in the book of Job, the devil wanted to destroy Job. And God said, you can go this far, but you can't go that far. 
That's the, that's the simplified version. You can go this far, but you can't go that far. So anything that you find taking place in your life, God wants to use it as a catalyst to drive you to him. The enemy wants to use it to destroy you. So Jesus is pleading for prayer as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he's asking his disciples, could you, could you just stay awake for a little longer and pray for me? There's a whole lot of spiritual context there, right? Because many times in our own walk with God, we get tired. <coughs> I'm just saying. Like, I know we get physically tired sometimes, right? When you work a lot. I know. I work a couple of jobs. I get physically tired. Sometimes we get, if we're not careful, we get burnt out in life. Uh, but, but, but look, they're burnt out. There's something else is happening here. They're, they're, becoming, they're becoming sleepy. And, and you know, there's a, there's a concept there about spiritual sleepiness. <clears throat> that we would fall asleep late in the midnight hour. Late before the end of time even, maybe. They're falling asleep at the most critical time of Jesus' life. When he's most desperate and in need of his friends to be there, he's about to be crucified. And they fall, they fall asleep. So he needed, he pleaded for prayer. The next thing was that Judas betrayed him. So while they're falling asleep and he's saying, hey, the, the time of the Son of Man is at hand, Judas is over there with, with the religious leaders selling out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And y'all remember that story, right? He finalizes the betrayal and he brings those various types of soldiers with him to the garden for Jesus to be finally betrayed. You know, in that story, too, I have a little side note right now because I feel like the Lord used a preacher a long time ago in my life to show me this. I want to just real quickly, this isn't even really one of my points, this is just a little line, Condemnation versus guilt. Because, you know, that night that Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter also denied him. The Word of God says in Matthew 27, 3, if you could put that up for me real quick. Before we move on to the rest of the message, I just want to take the opportunity to share with you a couple of truths about the betrayal, the denial of Jesus that night. The Bible says that Judas, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Now I want you to notice that the idea of the words repented himself isn't, doesn't mean the same thing as he repented. Repented himself describes Grief and sorrow after the fact. It, it describes the fact that he had made a huge mistake in his life and he was <clears throat> very sorrowful for it and he was overwhelmed with grief and the enemy put condemnation and guilt on him and the end result was that he was destroyed from it. We know the story. If you read the Bible, Judas hung himself. But, but it's not like he repented. Right. When you repent, you... You turn from what you were doing and you turn towards God and God ministers to your heart and he brings restoration. It's important that we understand something. If you ever walk into a church one day and things haven't exactly been right in your life or, you know, listen, ain't nobody's life in this place perfect, right? And whenever we're going through life, when... Uh, the preacher hears a word from the Lord and he begins to speak the truth. The Holy Spirit will ride on the words of truth and he will, he will do a work in our heart. And that's what you call conviction. Conviction is the Holy Spirit telling you and I that there's things in our life that he wants to deal with. There's a big difference between conviction and condemnation. God convicts, the devil condemns. God wants to set you free, the devil wants to lock you up. God wants to give you life. The devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy from you. Now, the same night that Peter betrayed and he was condemned and he died, Peter also denied three times. And the Lord had warned him. See, Peter was real big. He, he was like, though they all deny you, I'll never deny you. Jesus said, before the rooster crows three times, you will, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And that night, he sure did. He denied him. And, you know, he felt very sorrowful about it. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that he said, I go a fishing. Now, you know, fishing trip isn't a bad thing. But the problem is, is that there's more meaning to that in the Greek language of which the New Testament was written. Because Peter was previously a fisherman. 
The idea was that he was forsaking the calling that he had been given by Jesus and he was going to go back to his former way of life. And the real problem was, was that the rest of the disciples followed with him. And so now all these men that Jesus has been poured into based on the one decision of Peter and the guilt that he felt because of his mistake, he's moving away from what Jesus has called him to do and he's dragging others with him. But you know, the Lord never wants to leave you and I where we were if we if we made mistakes if we sinned and we moved away from god he will come to us he will send people to us and he will come to minister to us and that's exactly what jesus did on that fishing trip he showed up and he ministered to peter but look he spoke the truth to him and peter's response was that he repented peter humbled himself in the presence of the lord and you know he went on to live a great life in the kingdom of god he died a tragic death, but you know what? He died for Jesus. Just as his Savior died for him, he died for Jesus. Amen. And I, and I just wanted to remind you that, listen, we all go through, I wanted to just use that as an example, that we all go through things in our lives where we, where we fail the Lord because we're not perfect. But at the same time, when the Holy Spirit is contending with us and he's bringing conviction in our hearts and in our lives, let us turn to God. Let us repent and let him know that we're sorrowful and we need his grace to turn and to move in the right direction. And you need to understand that the enemy wants to try to beat you down and condemn you. But listen, if you're a child of God this morning... If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the presence of God lives on the inside of you, you don't need to listen to the lies of the devil. I know it's hard because sometimes he's screaming real loud. But listen, the word of the Lord wants to set you free. Amen. And I just wanted to tell you that this morning. I wanted to share that with you. Amen. So after these things have gone on, Jesus pleads for prayer. Judas betrays. Peter denies. When all this is going on, let's look at Matthew 27, and we're going to start reading in verse 27, and I'm going to read various passages of Scripture because I just want to remind you of what had taken place in this scenario whenever Jesus is hung on the cross. Amen? So Matthew 27, starting in verse 27, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall. And gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now the idea behind the scarlet is really, it's kind of like a purplish red color. And what they're doing here, it's really, it's like a robe of royalty. So really what they're doing is they're mocking him. And they'll, and they'll say it, you know, when we get there. It says, when they had plaited a crown of thorns, so they made him a crown for a king, right? They put it on his head, and they put a reed in his hand. And they bowed on their knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. In other words, they started hitting him on the head. So he's already got a crown of thorns on there. And they take the reed out of his hand and they start hitting him on the head on that crown of thorns, I would imagine, too. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment or clothing back on him. And they led him away to crucify now in verse, go down to verse 35 for me. And they crucified him, and they parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. So, you know, I, I, I wasn't much of a gambler, man. My daddy was a gambler, and he would make joke try to mess with me sometimes whenever I was a little kid I guess he was trying to teach me his ways and he'd say he, if we had dice off of a Monopoly game he'd grab them and he'd blow in his hands and he'd throw them up against the wall and he'd say you know come on give me some twos my baby needs some new shoes and I you know and, and you know he's like he, and he's talking all this stuff I just I'm only pre preparing you with that picture to let you know that that's basically what casting lots meant it was a form of throwing the die it was a form of seeing what was going to show up. And so what's happening here is that they're taking the clothing that Jesus had that they had ripped off of him and they're separating it because clothing was very expensive in those days. Fabric wasn't that easy to come by. And then they're casting lots for it. But what I want you to see there at the begin at the bottom there of, of verse 36, it says, and sitting down, they watched him there. 
See, part of what I want you to see in this passage of Scripture as we move through it is, I want you to see all of the, the various people and how the interaction is going on. And I want you to try to imagine that you're in this scene and that you can see the imagery of what's going on. Right? Jesus knows what's about to happen to him. He's praying for prayer. His disciples are falling asleep. Judas is betraying him. The soldiers come and get him. They thrust the crown of thorns on him. They hit him. There's another spot that says they blindfolded him and they slapped him. And they said, prophesy who it is that hit you. And they're mocking him. And they're saying, oh, hail, king of the Jews. And then they take his clothes and they're throwing dice for it. And, and they're gambling. And then they, they sat down there as they're doing it. I just imagine throw the dice and, and, and at the same time they're sitting there like looking at him and, be, and, and then they go back to doing what they're doing. Look at verse uh, 20, chapter 27 verse 38. And then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand another on the left and they that passed by reviled him. So here we so this is another image in the scene. People <laughs> shooting dice at the foot of the cross. Two thieves, we're told, are on each side. And then there's people walking by. It's like a road, you know. There's Really, Rome crucified a lot of people. And so, you know, there was probably multiple people that were actually being crucified. And the one that the Bible, the three that the Bible tells us about on that day is Jesus and the two thieves that are on both sides. And probably a string of people suffering and crucified. That's how harsh the Roman Empire was. I mean, people, that was like entertainment. Let, let's go take a walk down the, down the suffering road and let's see these people that are in misery. And so there's a group of people that pass by and they reviled him. It, it means to, you know, they're just saying stuff to him, just mean words. And they're wagging their heads like, oh, yeah. And this is what they're saying. They're saying, you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself if you're really the son of God. You know, so they're sitting there talking to each other and they're wagging their head. Oh my gosh, look at him. He said he was going to save himself and he can't even, he said he was going to save everybody. He can't even save himself. Why don't you just come down off that cross if you're really the son of God? And look what it says in verse 41. Likewise, or in a similar fashion, also the chief priests mocked him with the scribes and the elders. And this is what they said. He saved others himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. In other words, that means they, told, they were talking the same trash to Jesus as everybody else was. So hopefully I'm painting a little bit of a portrait for you to be able to see what's going on. Basically, this is a pretty bad day in the life of Jesus. I mean, as far as his humanity goes, because you do know he was 100% human, right? And he was 100% God. He was the God man. But listen to me, it's important. It's important. I teach this all the time. Jesus never stopped being God. I mean, my understanding of the scriptures as I scour through them and try to understand the Bible really for the way that it's written. Jesus never once stopped being God. But you got to understand that was not his mission given to him by the Father to come to this earth. It was not his, the mission of Jesus coming to this earth was not for him to be God on earth. No, Jesus was God in heaven. The word of God says that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, but then the word became flesh. Proverbs chapter 8 says that he was wisdom and he was on the right hand of the father there creating with the father. So before Jesus became incarnate, I'm not talking about reincarnation, I'm talking about incarnation. Before Jesus, the wisdom of God, the word of God, who was a separate entity as the eternal son. It might seem confusing, but I'm here to tell you that there's... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and it's always been that way. So when the Word spoke and said, let there be light, it wasn't God the Father's, it wasn't Jesus, wasn't just the Word coming out of His mouth, but that Jesus is the eternal Word and Jesus is the eternal Son. And good news, when you get there, you're going to understand it a whole lot better than I can explain. Amen. But he spoke the world into existence, but he never stopped being God. But his mission on earth given to him by the Father was not to be God on earth. 
His mission given to him by the Father was to be the last Adam. To make right what the first Adam made wrong. God didn't sin. God can't die. God doesn't go to sleep. Jesus never sinned, but he did sleep. He did eat, and he did die. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But he died not for his own sin because he had none. Instead, he died for your sin, and he died for mine. Hallelujah. That was the mission and the purpose of Jesus on earth. And so we see all of these people, and this is what Jesus has come to do, and we see this imagery of all of these people and the way that they're acting towards Jesus as he's suffering at the worst time of his human life. That's what I was trying to, trying to make, the, make the point. You know, in his humanity, Isaiah, the prophet, he was about 700 years before Jesus was ever here. He, he said that there was no beauty or comeliness. In other words, there was no, nothing attractive about him physically that we would be drawn to him. So God spoke, God the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophet Isaiah 700 years before Jesus would ever come. And he, he notified us physically, you weren't, it, well, he wasn't like some superstar, you know. I mean, it's way outdated, but like Fabio, where did, where did that guy come from? He just like <laughs> supposedly looked good and he got famous. It, it wasn't like that with Jesus. There was nothing physically that was going to attract people. As a matter of fact, when he was beaten, they say he was marred beyond recognition. He didn't. He, he was beaten so badly that, that it was a horrendous sight. And the people's hearts are hard and they're laughing at him and they're, they're reviling him. And so the thieves that deserve to what they were getting, they saying the same thing to him. Isn't, isn't it amazing how when people that, that, that their whole life is a mess and they're going to turn around and they're going to talk about your life being a mess. Lord, help us. Listen to me. Lord, deliver us from being concerned about what other people think. Lord, set us free from other people's opinions that ain't got no reason. They shouldn't even be voicing their opinion because their own life is jacked up. But they do, and we get, then we allow that to worry, to worry us, right? And, Lord, help us. All right, Luke 23, 35 through 37, just a couple more <laughs> verses that describe how these people are acting towards Jesus. I'm trying to give you a feel for this, because I want you to feel it, what he's going through. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him. That's another just saying mean things to him, saying he saved others, let him save, let him save himself if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. So we have people shooting dice at the foot of the cross, making fun of him, sitting out looking at him. we got the people of the world walking by, shaking their heads, saying, oh, he said he could save himself. And look at him, he's pitiful up there. we got the religious of the world walking by, saying the same thing. Look how weak he is. Look how weak and skinny he looks up on that cross. And we got, we got the, the soldiers mocking him and making fun of him also. This is a pretty bad day in the humanity of Jesus, I would say. I don't think that any of us have ever been embarrassed at this point. I mean, I can tell, I've told the story before. I hope you don't get tired of my story. <laughs> but I used to be, I used to have a really smart mouth. And you know, there's nothing better for a smart mouth person than for some people that are bigger and stronger than him <laughs> to like give him a little what for. And I don't know that I deserved exactly this, but I probably did. We were at the rodeo in Lafayette in the Blackham Coliseum, and we were in the area where all the livestock was, and I was talking trash, and I always used to hang out with a group of guys that were always older than me, stronger than me, and they could easily beat me up. All of one by one, they could have. And so certainly all of them together, I didn't have a chance because they were all older and bigger. And so I'm over there talking my trash to them, and they were like, dude, you're about to get it. So they held me down, they took all my clothes off except my underwear, and they threw my underwear somewhere else. And I was, that's pretty embarrassing. Right? I'm like over there trying to scratch and looking for my clothes to put my clothes back on. And that, the rest of that night, I kind of kept my mouth shut. The next day, I probably forgot about it, kept going. But that night, I was pretty quiet after all of that. But, you know, even with all of that said and done, it's not near as embarrassing. It's not near as humiliating 
as to what's taking place in the life of Jesus. That was just a little snapshot of childhood. But even today, sometimes people try to do things in our life. They make comments to hurt us, right? And, and, and to tear us down. And sometimes it's the people that are closest to us. And we entrust ourselves to them. And, 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 and at the same time, they steal our trust and they hurt us. The main imagery that I see, well, let, let's look at uh, Luke um, 23, verses 39 through 43, and then we'll, we'll move on. It says, in one of the male factors, and that's talking about one of those thieves, which were hanged, meaning on the side of him on the cross, railed on him. So now he's really, so listen, I want you to understand that this is a, this is nine hours, this is six hours that's going on. So Jesus was put on the cross at about nine o'clock in the morning, our time, and he was taken off the cross at about 3 p.m., which is interesting because that, that is actually the time for the animal sacrifices. There was a morning sacrifice at nine o'clock. And there was an evening sacrifice at 3 o'clock. And I'm here to tell you that that's not accidental. God knew exactly what he was doing. Because Jesus was the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. And all, what the main point I'm trying to tell you with that is, is that there's a process of time that all this is going on. Again, they're, shoot, the, they're shooting dice at the foot of the cross and making fun of him. The world is walking by and making fun of him. The religious leaders are walking by and making fun of him. The soldiers are walking by and making fun of him. The thieves that are hanging on either side in the beginning are making fun of him. And somewhere along the way, whatever is really happening, and you have to read each of the Gospels, to kind of see because he doesn't say a whole lot while he's up there because he's in agony and he's suffering. They say that whenever you're being crucified, they've, they, they've really tried to understand the physiology of what crucifixion and the, the, or the pathophysiology, if you will, meaning what, what is it that actually kills you? And they say that it has to do with suffocation because of the way that they're hanging like that and they don't really have a way to hold their body up and they're gasping for air because it's compressing their diaphragm and, and it's a slow, agonizing death. And so in order for him to get, muster up the strength just to say some of these words, it took a lot in him. And the Bible records that he said certain things. And whenever, and whenever he would speak, I'm sure that they would notice that he was saying stuff. Because listen, before this, a week before this, crowds are following him. Everybody knows who he is. He read, you know, the, the, you remember the procession when he came into town riding on a donkey, they threw palm leaves and they said, oh, hallelujah, son of David. And they were calling him the king. And that's why they're mocking him now a week later. And they put a sign up there, the king of the Jews. And these people are listening, and I just want you to know that in the beginning, around 9 o'clock, I'm just assuming, 9 o'clock after everything's settled out and everybody's on the cross, and they're starting to hurt, that the two criminals are looking at him, and they're both, like, making fun of him at the same time. Something happens, though, throughout the course of that six hours. Because, listen, there's another spot, I didn't even put it in my notes, there's another spot where one of those soldiers, he realizes something at the end when Jesus dies. The way that Jesus died, one of those soldiers is sitting there. I don't know if the rest of them are still down there where they were shooting dice or not. But one of those soldiers says, when he sees the way he died, truly this was the Son of God. You see, if you will watch the behavior of Jesus and you will listen to his words, even when you're going through things in life and sometimes you've ignored him, Sometimes you've ignored what he's offered unto you, but if you will watch closely enough or you will pay just a little bit of attention at some point in time, there's a good chance that you're going to change your mind. And not only did one of those soldiers change his mind, but look at this, verse 39, one of the malefactors of the thieves which were hanged there, he railed on him. In other words, he's still talking trash. Can I just say it like that? Saying, if you are the Christ, then save yourself and us. But the other one answered and rebuked him. Now, I don't know exactly what words it was that Jesus had said. I don't know what kind of attitude that Jesus displayed. Probably just nothing but an innocent lamb dying on a cross. And something happened to that other thief in that six hours. Where his complete mindset changed. 
His heart changed. And this is what he said. He rebuked him and he said, Do you not fear God, seeing that you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, in other words, we deserve it, for we receive the due reward of what we've done. But this man has done nothing amiss or wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall be with me, you shall be with me in paradise. Now, there's a whole lot that could be said about that, and I don't want to take the time to really break it down too deep, but I do want to say that as long as there's breath in your lungs, it's never too late. Amen? I'm not encouraging you to wait to the very end to make it right with the Lord. Some people say, oh, I don't believe in them deathbed confessions. Well, guess what, buddy? You're not the one to determine who was true and sincere with God and who wasn't. But I can tell you one thing, even if it's your last breath, if you're sincere with the Lord, he knows it. And don't tell me he's the one that decides who makes it and who doesn't. So it's never too late as long as you've got breath in your lungs. The main imagery that I'm seeing in this scene where all this stuff is going on of the Lord's life is that everyone is against him. We're going to look at it a little bit more closely, but he's being mocked and he's being tormented. I can't imagine all the betrayal and hurt that has hit him all at once. In just a matter of hours after entering the Garden of Gethsemane, he's bombarded and attacked and betrayed on multiple levels. The people that were closest to him, they betrayed him. The people that he loved sold him for silver. Those that were closest to him couldn't even stay awake and pray for him when he needed them the most. How will he respond? Remember, the title of my message this morning is Response ability not responsibility but response ability god has given us an ability to have a right response how will he respond what will be his course of action in the way that he will handle the most desperate and crucial time in his life i think this is a very relevant question to ask because this is what jesus said in john 15 18 through 19 he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, that scripture tells me this. That just as the various aspects of the world treat Jesus with hatred and take advantage of him at this point in his life, it's very likely that if we're true followers of Jesus, that there are going to be times that the same will happen to us. <laughs> now, I want to try to explain this to you the best way I know how, and I'm not here to try to make anybody feel weird. So if I list off something <coughs> that maybe is a... Something that's going on in your life right now, I'm not doing any of that on purpose to point you out. Okay, and anything that I talk about in just a moment is things that I've had struggles with in my own life. But I need you to understand that there's the world and then there's the church. Now, you also need to understand that everything that calls itself the church is not really the church of God. Or what are you trying to say, preacher, that your church is the only true church? Of course not. It's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm trying to make a point. When a person is born in Adam the first time, they're born in sin and they're born in the world. They're part of the world. But when you hear the good news of the gospel about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit deals with your heart and you, you say yes to Jesus and you invite him in and you ask forgiveness of your sin, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. The Bible says that when that happens, that you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So the church is synonymous with the kingdom of light. The world is synonymous with the kingdom of darkness. The two of them do not come together and mic-mash as one. There's not a conglomeration of the world and the church. And we call it the, the church world where, where we live with one foot in each one. No. There's, there's the church, the people of God living in light, 
And then there's the world. Now, do sometimes the people of God that love God and that are truly saved do worldly things? Yes, that happens sometimes. But is it God's will that we live our lives that way perpetually? Absolutely not. I can tell you that and prove that to you beyond the shadow of a doubt throughout the scriptures if you care to know. And what I'm here to tell you is that God has always demanded that his people be separated from the world around them. That's why when he created the nation of Israel, he demanded that they be circumcised. I'm not talking, you know, I, had, I remember one time we were talking about circumcision in the old church. And some guy came up to the old pastor and said, dude, I'm not, do I have to be circumcised? <laughs> and like, no, no, no. See, that was an Old Testament covenant. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting sign because you see, it's the cutting away of flesh through the shedding of blood. Flesh is synonymous in the New Testament with sin, the sinful aspect of man. So it's a great type of what the cross was going to do for the child of God. That God wants to rid us of our flesh, that part of us that wants to react in sin, however that sin looks. So what I need you to understand is this, is that the world is not the same as the church. Now, there's a big part of the church that has brought the world into its house. Because, because the reality of it is that we just want everybody to feel comfortable. We, we want you to feel comfortable. We want you to, to be okay. But, but that's not okay. For If I have to uh, present my message in such a way that you can feel comfortable in your sin, any more than it's okay for me to feel comfortable in my sin. God wants his truth preached. <clears throat> He wants the availability of the truth to go forward so that the Holy Spirit can deal with each and every one of our hearts. So that the Holy Spirit can convict us of where we are in our life. So that he can get a hold of us, amen, and do a work on the inside of us. But see, the world is going in a certain direction. Now, listen, I, I, don't, you, I don't probably ought to not get this deep, but I'm going to. <laughs> because, like, let's take drinking, for instance, as an example. All right, you ready? All right, just work, just bear with me. So, people would say, well, you know, the Lord turned water into wine. The Lord drank whenever he ate. Well, first of all, let's understand something. I can assure you, Jesus never got inebriated. Now, some people would say, oh, but that wine wasn't even for fermented. That was juice. I don't even want to get in on that. I'm going to tell you right now, they cut their wine three parts to one part with water. All right. And I'm going to promise you, Jesus never got drunk. Jesus never drove while buzzed. Jesus never got buzzed. And let me tell you how I know that. Because had he done that, he wouldn't have rose from the dead. What you talking about, preacher? The Bible says drunkenness is a sin. I'm not talking about some drunkard laying up under a bridge that, ain't, that can't hold down a job. That's not what I'm talking about. The word of God says in Ephesians 5, 18, be ye not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Whenever you and I take too much of any type of substance and it begins to change our mindset, then now we're not focusing on the Lord the way that we should. We're not trusting in the Lord the way that we should. We're looking and, we're, and, and something's being changed. I don't know about you, but I don't act like a believer or a Christian whenever I get to drinking. I can tell you that right now. <clears throat> I start talking in ways I ought not talk. I start doing things I ought not do. I'm not acting like a Christian whenever I engage in those types of behavior. And I'll tell you something else about me. Today, it'll start off as one glass of wine. Oh, well, you got an alcohol problem. Man, I got all kinds of problems outside of Jesus. That's right. I, I drink a glass of wine today, and the next thing you know, I'm doing all kinds of stuff I ain't supposed to do. And that's, that's me. You might say, well, I can drink three beers, and I'm good to go. Listen to me. The word, the word of God says this, abstain even from the appearance of evil. Okay, so now, what does that mean, preacher? Well, let me just explain something to you. Let's just say for a second that, the Lord, that you've given your heart to the Lord and the Holy Spirit is dealing with your life about some things. About, about having a desire to start walking more closely with God, Right? And let's say, like he did for me, whenever I truly gave my heart to the Lord, he convicted me about drinking in my heart. And, this, and that's what he told me. He said, when you drink, you don't act like a Christian. So you need to stop. All right, well, let's say, though, that we're, we're still in this place in our life where we're justifying our actions. Do you, do you agree with me? And you might not agree with me, but it's okay. We don't have to agree on everything, I hope. I hope we can still talk about it and love each other in the end. 
But see, to me, even drinking in one part of the world compared to another part of the world may have a little bit of a different context. What are you trying to say? Somebody drinking now watered wine in France is a lot different than somebody drinking a beer in South Louisiana. Yep. Well, what are you trying to say? Well, in South Louisiana, when people drink, there's something connected to that idea. What is it? <laughs> Le bon temps roulette. Let the good times roll, my friend. And so when people are drinking in South Louisiana, it's got a whole different context. It's Mardi Gras, it's the parade, it's like we're going to have our fun, and we're going to, you understand what I'm saying? Well, listen to me, that's what the world does. The world says it's okay to get drunk on Saturday night and show up to church on Sunday and act like everything's okay. I'm here to tell you that's not what the Word of God says. Amen? So I'm using that as one example to try to describe the difference between the world and the church. That's just one example. There's multiple examples. And now, you either believe I'm telling you the truth or you don't. I can tell you something else. If, for some reason, you're a person that still drinks, and again, I didn't plan on picking on any particular person, but if the shoe fits, wear it. Amen? Because I believe that what I'm telling you is the truth. So if you come in this place and then when the preacher says something, all of a sudden you start feeling frustrated in your heart over it, it might not be that I'm not telling you the truth. It might be that I am telling you the truth and that the devil doesn't want you to hear it. How dare he talk about it? No, 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 no. I don't tell you nothing that the Lord didn't tell me first. That's that. Now you can move. We can move on. Amen? So... He's chosen us out of the world. And, and I guess my point was this. Now, let me, let me take that back to where we started. If the world hates you, you need to know that it hated me first. If you were part of the world, they wouldn't hate you. They would love you because you were one of them. Oh, now it makes more sense. So now I'm the same guy that I was born of my mama, except now I've been born again. And so then the Lord deals with me about drinking beer. And then the next thing you know, I show up at my partner's house. Hey, dude, what's happening? Hey, you want a beer, man? I got a cold one in the fridge. Man, you know what? Thank you, but I feel like the Lord's showing me. That's going to work out okay. Oh, man, that's good. I'm happy for you. But watch in a week. Watch in two weeks. Watch in a month. If you keep taking that stand, you know what's going to happen? Because you see, people that drink in excess or people that do drugs, or people, they ain't feeling good about it. They already been making mistakes and, 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 and they're sorrowful sometimes for the decisions that they make while they're on these things. And the Lord's already dealing with them. And then now you allowing God to make a change in your life is going to bring an offense in their life. And when you take a stand like that, it's going to bring conviction in their life. Or whenever you're talking and you change the course of the conversation, it might be, they, they, they're going to feel really weird whenever they start telling inappropriate jokes and you're not laughing anymore. You're going to start to feel weird whenever they're telling inappropriate jokes and it's not really funny anymore. And, and, and even on the early end, I know I'm going on and on about this kind of stuff, but I'm trying to make it clear what I mean by if the world hates you, just remember it first hated me. And you don't need to be confused about it. I'm trying to break it down real time so you can understand what I'm trying to say. When you quit laughing at their jokes, the first thing, though, is you're probably going to laugh at them jokes for the first few months. Even though the Lord's dealing with you on the inside. You know, they call it locker room talk. Well, look, the G Jesus didn't do locker room talk. Jesus didn't talk about women the way that men talk about women. And, 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 you know, on, in the world. That's not how Jesus handled his business. When the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, that's not how the Holy Spirit wants you to talk. That's not the kind of conversation that the Holy Spirit wants you to, wants you to be part of, right? And so what's going to happen, though, is, is that before the work is completed in your heart, the Holy Spirit is going to deal with you when that joke comes. How do you know, preacher? Because I lived it. And the Lord came into my heart and he changed me. And the first couple of conversations that I'm in, in the oil field with these guys, and they're talking the way that we always talk, the Lord's dealing with me. And he's basically telling me, why don't you get up and walk out of here? Because I don't feel real comfortable in this room right now. But instead, I just sit there and I just listen. And then when the punchline comes, <laughs> just like a little puppet. You know? So I'm just telling you what's happened to me. And that's what I mean by that scripture 
If the world hates you, just remember that it hated me first. The world hates Jesus in this scene. They're doing nothing but making fun of him. They're mocking him. And I just want to try to give you a picture of what the difference between the church and the world is. I don't know how much more clear I can make it. Amen. And at the same time, I want you to understand this. God's never expecting you to do it in your own strength. I started it off this way. I'm going to say it again. God's not asking you to try to live for him through your own willpower. God wants to give you his power to give you the strength so that you can make the right decisions. And listen, I want to say this and then I'm going to move on with my message. If we never start making moves in the right direction, we're never going to make moves in the right direction. At some point in time, we got to quit saying no to the devil and start saying yes to the Lord. And if we're unwilling to do that, I'm telling you right now, guilt, sorrow, condemnation, just like hit what hit Judas, will eventually hit us. I do believe that there's some valuable things that we can learn from the various aspects of this story of the crucifixion. One, you have to be able, this is the, one of the first things I want to show you. You have to be able to believe that God is working on your behalf. You know, whenever you have a response ability, whenever the world is coming against you and mocking you, or when, because of your faith, or whenever people are doing you wrong, people are going to do you wrong. You have to be able to truly believe that God is working on your behalf. Because, listen, if not, you know what you're going to try to do? You're going to try to take matters into your own hands. I don't know I've told the story before, but that's kind of like how my, dad, my old daddy was. He was just... It was hardcore. I mean, I think they called Marines back in the day like a leatherneck. And that's basically what he was. He was an old Marine in Korea, football, and he was a leatherneck. And he said, boy, let me tell you something. As soon as they look silly at you cross-eyed, pop them in the mouth. Hit them first. <laughs> that was how my dad was going to figure out and fix his situation. Take control of the situation. And that's what, we're, that's what we're trained in our mind. Maybe it's not always popping somebody in the mouth, but... I'm going to take control of this situation. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to be a fixer. And what I'm trying to say is, is that many times we find ourselves in situations, and when, especially whenever we give our heart to the Lord and he's trying to move us in the right direction. If we're always trying to fix the situation, he's going to allow more frustration to come in. So what I'm trying to say is, is that when you face things in life and people are coming against you, you have to be able to believe that God is working on your behalf. There's a part to maturity in Christ that we got to come to the place where we believe I can really let this go. I can really let this go and trust God. Because listen to me, if somebody is messing with you, if somebody's taking from you, if somebody's lying about you, if somebody's doing something that they're not supposed to be doing to you and you can have the grace of God. To surrender that over to the Lord and trust God. And if you can protect your heart against what's going on with that, I'm telling you right now, God will come to your defense. Amen. I don't know how he's going to do it. And it's not even your will or my will that we need to figure out what we want God to do. What we need, what we need to want God to do is to help that person. You, you understand that? And we're about to see this. But at the same time, I just need you to know, you have to be able to believe that God is working for you. Even though we can't always see it in the physical, we have to be able to believe that God is handling business for us in the spiritual. One aspect of the story that stands out to me is the way that Pontius Pilate's wife was affected. I didn't read it, but let's read it now. Matthew 27, 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife, Pontius Pilate's wife, Sent unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. This is just one aspect in one little way I want to describe something. Everybody's treating Jesus wrong. And while you may not be able to see God working on your behalf in the physical, you have to be able to trust that God can accomplish some things in the spiritual on your behalf. That woman went to bed the night before... And she lost sleep 
God entered into her dreams. God dealt with her, and she was all uncomfortable. God took peace away from her, and he replaced it with chaos. I'm here to tell you that if people come against the anointing of the Lord, the Lord knows how to steal peace from them to remove it, and he will do it. That's right. Because he loves you, and he cares for you. And you got to get to the point where you can truly let God be your defender. You got to quit trying to defend yourself. You got to quit trying to take up for yourself. And let me tell you something else. You don't have to live in fear because people are telling you that they're going to do something to you or they're going to treat you wrong or they're going to take from you. You don't have to live in fear because the death, because God is more powerful than the devil. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. God will defend you. He will work on people the way he sees fit. He will take away their peace, their sleep. He will invade their dreams if that's what he chooses to do. They will experience chaos even though they may be trying to cause you chaos at the same time. God can give you peace if you can trust him and allow him to have his way. And how will you know if you're not allowing him to have his way? Because you're manipulating the situation and trying to take control of the circumstances. And you know what the result is? Frustration and lack of peace in your own life. Instead of your enemy receiving it, you are because you're trying to handle it your way and fix it your way. That's the first thing I wanted you to know. I want you to know that you can truly trust that God has your back. That is a hard lesson to learn. I got to tell you, that is a hard lesson to learn. Because when you feel all that frustration rising up in your spirit, you want vengeance. You want to be, to prove yourself, right? If you will let go and let God have his way, I'm telling you, it will bring great peace to your life. The second thing I wanted you to know is that even though many may come against you, God expects you to learn and respond his way and not your own. Not only, so not only do you want to try to fix your situation, but a lot of times your flesh gets in the way and you want to retaliate. There's always a godly versus a worldly way to respond in any given situation. My daddy's theory doesn't work in the, in, the, in the Christian world. You can't just go around popping people in the mouth. So basically I'm saying there will always be a right choice to be made. The way that we learn the right choices is through faith, practicing the truth of Christianity. Let me just say that again. This is the way you do it. It's through faith, the practicing of the truth. Through Christianity. How do we do that preacher? How do I practice Christianity. The truth of Christianity through faith. Alright well I'm going to tell you. I talked about it Wednesday night. You got to learn the knowledge of God. Through studying his word. Do I tell you that you have to be a Bible scholar? Absolutely not. Do I tell you you have to read five chapters a night? No. But you have to come to the place. Where you start putting the word of God. On the inside of you. You learn the knowledge of God through studying his word. Well, I have a hard time wanting to read and study the Bible. I'm busy and I get tired. These are some things that we say, right? I know these are things that I've said, so don't think I'm picking on you. Uh, I'm tired and I'm busy and I don't have a whole, I got so many other things to do. You know, like Brother Larson would say, okay, well, if that's you over here, you take a nap and I'll talk to you for a little bit. Because there's no other way to get the word of God and the knowledge of God on the inside of you other than to read and to study the word of God. If you don't read and study the word of God, if you don't learn the knowledge of God, then you're just going to be operating through the knowledge of the world. Does that make sense? How did you learn the knowledge of the world? Through your mama and your daddy? Oh, but my mom and dad were good people. I didn't say they were. <laughs> but were they godly people? Did they train you up in the ways of the Lord? Did they give you godliness? Or did they teach you what their fathers taught them and their fathers before them and their fathers before them? Right? And so whether you learned your worldliness through your people, through your friends, through the people that you hung around with, whoever the case, what I'm trying to say is if you're going to learn the knowledge of God, you're going to have to get it out of his word. I'm going to do my best to give it to you on Wednesday and Sunday night, Sunday mornings. But that's not enough. you got to put it in for yourself. you got to study to show yourself approved. Right. 
So we learn knowledge from God through studying His Word and the Holy Spirit, Spirit speaking to our hearts through His Word. And then, like I said Wednesday night, God will allow trials and tests and temptations. Let me say that again. Here you are, you're born again, now the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. You're, you're, you're studying, you're trying to read the Bible, and, you're, and, and as you're reading the Bible, remember, this doesn't happen overnight. As you're reading the Bible, though, and you're hearing messages preached about the Bible, more and more of the Word of God is entering into the inside of who you are. And along the way, God is also allowing trials, tests, temptations to come your way. To test the knowledge of God that you've been putting on the inside of yourself. You know, for me... I don't, you know, one of the things that I've learned in Christianity, God doesn't want me to be bound by anything. I'm just saying. I'm not saying that I haven't been bound by anything even since I've been a Christian. But God doesn't want me to be a slave to anything. He doesn't want me to be bound by anything. You might not think that what I'm about to tell you is that bad, but I used to be so bound to dip in skulls. I mean, a can and a half a day, I would shut that stuff all up in my lip. And every day I would look at my gums and my, my lip in the mirror and I was over there freaking out, living in fear. Oh my gosh, I got a sore. You know, what's going to happen? But yet at the same time, I couldn't get free from it. And it wasn't until the Lord delivered me from it. But it never failed. I would get off the stuff for a period of time. And then it seemed like the most famous thing that would happen to me was that I'd blow up another motor or a transmission. And I wasn't driving and hot riding and all this. I guess it was just because I couldn't afford a decent car. And so my car would burn up. I'd overheat the car. The head gasket would blow. And it's like, oh, Lord, here, here, here we go again. All this stress. And instead of me understanding that I'm supposed to go to the Lord and release it to him, what do I do? I go shove a can of dip in my lip, even though I hadn't been dipping it. And the next thing you know, shoving dip in my lip makes me feel guilty. So now what do I do? I go buy a 40-ounce quart of beer, and I start drinking that. And if I drink quarts of beer long enough, God only knows what I'll end up doing again. Because I've done a whole lot worse than that. What I'm trying to say is, is that it's, it's a repetitive behavior. It's a cycle. Because I keep, I'm going to have to keep taking the same test. If I don't pass the test, I'm going to keep having to take the same test. And sometimes I could end up in the church for 25 years and feel like I never really grew. It's possible. But it's not God's fault. It's because I've never applied myself to the word. I've never put the word on the inside of me. And I've never surrendered and trusted God to have his way with me. Amen? Hopefully that makes some sense. So he'll allow trials and tests and temptations to occur in our lives that present an opportunity to apply the knowledge of God in the situation. And as the knowledge of God is applied, we learn the wisdom of God. See, application of knowledge is wisdom. Right? If not, we keep using the wisdom of the world. Going back to what we always knew. Just like the children of Israel. Let's go back to Egypt. Watermelons and onions and garlic and leeks. And they just forgot that they were like a bunch of slaves making bricks. And all they remember is how good it felt to eat garlic. I mean, I like garlic in my food. I, I like garlic. I don't know if my patients like it the next morning, <laughs> but I like garlic. But I don't want to live my life longing for garlic when God's trying to bring me out of being a slave. I don't want to keep going back to that. Amen. So in this aspect of the story of God, we learn God's wisdom through the actions of Jesus. When the world mistreats him, he responds godly. His focus is always the Father's will, which is to show the most magnificent form of love that the world has ever seen. He willingly dies to save people that were brutally offensive and mean to him. Think about that. They stripped him and put, this is verse 28 of Matthew 27. They stripped him, and I'm just going to read through these. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head, and after that they mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment or clothing on him and led him away to crucify him. Verse 35. And they crucified him. And parted his garments, casting lots, in verse 36. And sitting down, they watched him there. And verse 39. 
And they passed, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, You that destroy us the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you be the Son of God. Come down from that cross. Verse 41. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and then we will believe him. The thieves also, verse 44. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth, meaning they threw the same words in his face. And this was his godly response. You ready? Luke 23, 34. This was the response from Jesus in the midst of all of this. And while all this was going on in front of him, he praised this. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then they parted his clothing and they cast his lots. So what are you saying? Are you saying that I need to just let people do to me whatever they want to do to me? No, absolutely not. But wait, hold on a minute. You're the pastor, buddy. You have to forgive. Yes, of course I have to forgive. I've learned that the hard way. Because if you don't forgive, your heart gets hard. That's right. And nobody's drama is worth my heart getting hard. And separating me from God. I have to forgive, but what I don't have to do, and this is just something that's been in my heart lately. I told somebody about it yesterday. I'm about to preach on it coming up. What I don't have to do is keep Jonah in my boat. If Jonah is heading to Tarshish instead of Nineveh, meaning if Jonah is rebelling against God, I don't have to keep him in my boat. Because, and I'll soon preach on him, but until then, I just need you to know he was, he was rebelling against God. He was told to go to Nineveh, but he went the opposite way. And the result of his disobedience caused a storm in other people's lives to the point where they almost lost their own life. You see, I have to allow God to give me the grace I need to forgive others. I have to protect my own heart against bitterness and anger so that I won't move farther away from God. But what I don't have to do is allow someone else, whoever they may be, to shipwreck my faith. You know, listen, this is, this, I think this is good right here. Because sometimes people don't realize that pastors have to trust God too. Yeah. Newsflash. <laughs> See, before I can wake up and try to be a husband, a father, a productive worker, even a pastor, you know what I had to do this morning? Something real simple. I had to wake up this morning and choose, by God's grace, to serve him myself today. That's right. Through God's grace, he's given me a free will to wake up each and every day. And that's the first and foremost thing I have to do. I have to wake up this morning and choose... I'm going to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to learn what that means. And if anybody's choices and lifestyles are going to create an atmosphere to put that in danger. Or create an atmosphere of a storm that's constantly stealing my peace. It's not me that needs to go. If they're still in my peace, then, then, then it doesn't even mean I don't know love. But I cannot allow... Somebody else's storm to steal my peace. Jonah, you're going to have to go to Tarshish by yourself. <clears throat> I'm telling you this for yourself this morning. Well, what are you trying to say? Do I need to leave my husband? I'm not telling you to leave your husband. I'm just telling you if Jonah is on his way to Tarshish and he's not going to Nineveh and it's causing a storm in your life. All I know is, is that you got to be able to let God calm the storm. You need to hear from the word of the Lord for yourself. You need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you, amen. Whether well, it might be your bestie, it might be your best friend, that every time you go see your bestie, what happens? You end up engaging in sinful activity. Lord help us. If they're Jonah, he can go to Tarshish by himself as far as I'm concerned. You're going to have to be thrown into the storm that you allowed to be created for yourself. And I will have to trust God that he prepared a fish, a plan to get you where he wants you to go. Because my boat isn't strong enough to weather your storms and mine too. Amen? So I'm sorry if you refuse to follow him. I won't be able to remain close to you. I'm trying to help you. Uh, anybody that, th this goes for all of us in this room. Do you have a Jonah in your life? I'm just trying to say. 
Because see, Jesus in the midst of all this, Jesus is Jesus and he's got a power source and he's going through and we're learning great things from him. Great humility, great surrender. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I'm not trying to tell you, if you got people in your life that are genuinely trying to serve God, then no, it's not okay for you to not forgive and not to be there for that person. That's not okay. I'm talking about people that are not really trying to live for the Lord. And they're just wreaking havoc in your life. And their chaos is causing chaos in your life. You know, I think sometimes about women that find themselves in abusive relationships. Whether it be verbal, verbal abuse or physical abuse or whatever kind of abuse. That is, I can't even imagine the constant storm and chaos and the confusion that would be created from that. That's like being in a prison cell. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Like, like you're in the same house and in the same room with this person and they're constantly berating you and they're constantly talking down to you and they're speaking words that are harmful and maybe even worse than that, hurting you. No, you need to get out of that. If you can't communicate with that person and say, hey, the words that you speak to me are hurting me and you yourself can't change the way. That is, that's, that's toxic. All right, last point. God's will was so important to Jesus that he was willing to give up his life for it. He willingly died. It was God's will that he would die for the sins of men. Look at John 10, 18. This is just a thought I had. But in this scripture, I've thought about this scripture a lot. No man takes it from me. Jesus is talking about his life. No man takes it from me, but I'll lay it down of myself. He said, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received of my father. Now, I think about, I've thought about this scripture a lot because there's a lot of, there's a lot, this is deep. This is a lot deeper than what, what you realize. <laughs> Why did he have to receive permission from his father to die? Because he had no sin. See, the word of God says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. See, you and I, we all deserve to die because we were born in sin of Adam, but now, and so we received a sinful nature from our father, Adam. But if I could describe it to you the way that my people used to talk about a card game and say, okay, Matthew, you want to play, you need to ante up. In other words, you got to take your chip and throw it in the pile in order to be able to play the game. We were all born of Adam and we all had sin in us, but we've all anted up and got into the game. Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So every last one of us has sinned. And the wages of sin is death. But Jesus had no sin. Therefore, there, he couldn't die. So he received permission from his father to die. Because the purpose of his death wasn't for his own sin. Because he had none. Instead, it was for our sin. But then I started imagining the power that Jesus had. But he didn't exercise. For instance, in the garden, you remember when the soldiers came to him, there's a spot in John, I believe it is, where he says, he's, he's, he's standing and it's like they're at his back and he says, whom do you seek? And they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. Judas brought him up in there. And, and Jesus said, I am. And when he said that, in the Greek, that's what he said, I am. They all fell to the ground under the power of God. And in that same instance, when they came to get him in the garden, he said, did you not know that I can pray to my father and he would send a legion of angels? 6,000 angels. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You talk about a massacre. 6,000 angels. If I pray to my father, he'll send a legion of angels down here. And all I have to say is, I am, and you're all on your face. He didn't say all that, but I'm saying that's what happened. So I think of all of that and that restrained power. And I was imagining this. I'm just, this is just my imagination. I'm not trying to tell you it didn't happen. But... It would be kind of cool if it did, but it didn't. I'm imagining he's hanging on the cross and the crowd and the soldiers and the religious leaders are laughing and they're mocking and they're calling him weak. And just for one moment, he decides to, to show them who's really the boss. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just for a quick second. Oh, he said he was going to save others and he can't even save himself. Why don't you come down from off that cross right there? And just think of one of the last words that he said was, Father, send that legion of angels. And then he came down off that cross. 
And just like they did in the garden, they all fell to the ground under the power of God. And then just that fast, he got back up on the cross. And then they all get back up and they know something weird just happened. But they're not really sure exactly what it was. Wouldn't that be something? No, it's really just to show you who's really the boss here. But it's like restrained power that he did not exert. Why? Because he knew what the Father's will was. He was convinced of what the Father's will was, so he did not have to have his quote-unquote day in court. He knew who he was. He knew what his assignment was. People can say all this stuff about him, and they can talk all this bad stuff about him, but he knew what God's purpose for his life was. And now i got to ask you, and i got to ask myself, do we understand what God's purpose for our life is? Because I'm telling you, God has a purpose for you. It may not be to stand behind the pulpit. It might not even be to teach children. It might not be to sing in the church. But I guarantee you that this is God's purpose for your life. And how do I know? Because he wants it for everybody. It's that you would give your heart and life to him. And that you would learn his ways. And that you would begin to live your life in such a way that it looks more like the Lord than the world. And that in the end result, what happens is that he gets glory and another. And that's God's will on the earth. It always has been and it always will be until the end of the age. He didn't feel like that was necessary. He was convinced that the Father's will was the right way to go. He exercised the permission that the Father gave him and he willingly died to fulfill the Father's will. So I'm closing with this. Now imagine your own self. People are mocking you and ridiculing you over your walk with Jesus and you feel like it's not worth it and you want to quit. Or else you're struggling with something in your life and it feels like you can't get free from. I have to tell you that none of that is true. You don't have to quit on God. You don't have to be a slave to that thing. Just as Jesus had a free will. Think about that. This, I don't even know that I'm going to explain this properly, but this is the most profound thing that hit me when I was studying for this message. Okay, and I know I've used up all my words, and I've probably lost you, but I hope that I can properly get this point across. I started thinking about the fact that you might not understand it all, right? But, but God, let, let me see where I found myself. You might not understand it all, but if you will trust him, God will allow you to die to the sin and the pain in your life and to exchange it for life. Again, I, I don't think I really made the point that I wanted to make. God the Father gave Jesus permission to die. Jesus had a will of his, he had a human will. And he took that human will and he exercised it to die physically on the cross. To pay the penalty for our sin. So that we could now have access to the presence of God. So that we, with the free will that we've been given to God, can allow those things in our life to die. We can, uh, those things can die. That's right. I'm talking about the things that hold us back from God. He's already paid the price. We just have to take our free will that he's given us. And we have to surrender it to him. We have to lay it down at his feet. And we have to tell him, we have to ask him, please take it. And we have to mean it. And when we mean it, I'm telling you, he will go to work for us. And he will give grace and strength where we can't do it. You may not believe me, but if that's not what you want, then I believe you're not wanting God's will for your life. And I know this, that I pray that God would give you the grace that you need to die to yourself so that he would do, I'll pray for myself that he would do the same for me. But I got to tell you, that's all I got. I don't have anything else because this is what the Lord showed me in his word. And this is the story that I'm going to stick to. Amen. Y'all come up here and play us a song. We're going to close. So the essence of the, of the story goes that Jesus in the worst time of his life, when he was facing ridicule and shame, when he was facing pain and heartache, he was able to give a response. And the response that he gave was godly, and it was full of love. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
And God wants you and I to come to the place in our life where we can truly release those things and we can truly forgive others. And when we do that, I'm telling you, you will find great strength in your life if you will humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. If you need prayer this morning, the altars are open. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.